I'd like to start my talk with a disclaimer. This is a very unashamedly one-sided presentation. The other side of the argument is constantly played out in the media. If you do feel the need to hear the other side of the argument, please play it very quietly in your internal monologue as I go along. When people think of CCTV or surveillance, the image that sums up surveillance most of them is the CCTV camera. I'm going to talk to you today about those cameras, but obviously this is just a part of the surveillance state that is all around us. CCTV, though, is an issue that is particularly interesting because it is so representative of what we are up against in general. I hope by the end of my talk you'll get an idea of this. CCTV is yet another lie in a long list of lies sold to the general public. CCTV, CCTV has been sold as a tool for crime prevention, crime detection, and crime clear-up. But it's all a lie. Hundreds of millions of pounds of public money has been wasted on this lie, and much more is set to be wasted in the future unless we halt the expansion of the surveillance state. In the late 1990s, more than 75% of Home Office crime prevention budget was spent on CCTV. It is estimated there are around 4.2 million surveillance cameras in the UK, which puts us at the number one position in the global league table for the ratio of cameras to people. We have a camera for every 14 people. 20% of the world's cameras watching 1% of the world's population. Yet, only 2.4% of the British public has a criminal record, and a minuscule 0.6% of Britons have received a custodial sentence for committing a criminal offence. Now, the UK has no codified formally codified constitution. But our way of life for hundreds of years has had at its core certain principles of common law and equity. The principle that you are free to do anything that isn't specifically legis legislated against, or more correctly, isn't unlawful, and the fundamental legal principle of innocent until proven guilty. In recent years, we've seen these fundamental principles eroded by the introduction of illiberal laws and the increasing use of surveillance technologies such as CCTV. Anonymity is not a crime. In fact, English common law is built upon the right to anonymity implicit in the right to walk down the street unchallenged provided you are not doing something unlawful. Surveillance cameras present a serious threat to privacy and civil liberties. And the alleged trade-offs of safety or security are unproven and vastly outweighed by the risks of creating a police state. We are being asked to trust that the state will not misuse its powers, whilst the state refuses to trust us as it expands its surveillance and treats us all as suspects. <laughs> but if you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear, right? That suggests that law-abiding citizens do not need or deserve their right to privacy. Surely law-abiding citizens deserve privacy the most. <laughs> so what have the politicians traded our freedoms for? CCTV must work, right? Well, let's look at some of the many studies into CCTV, some funded or commissioned by the Home Office. Home Office Police Research Group 1992 found the public acceptance is based on a limited and partly inaccurate knowledge of the functions and capabilities of CCTV, and that respondents referred to television programmes such as Crime Watch as their source of information about CCTV. University of Wales Violence Research Group, Cardiff 1999, found in a study that this study provides no evidence of a deterrent effect. Local government studies, 1999, found that CCTV may actually undermine the natural surveillance in towns and communities. The result may be a further spiral of social fragmentation and atomization, which leads to more alienation and even more crime. Home Office Study 252, 2002. 
it was found that CCTV had no effect on violent crimes from five studies. Cambridge Evaluation of the Effects of CCTV on Crime, 2007. The Cambridge Evaluation is consistent with prior research in showing no significant desirable effect of CCTV on crime in city centres. In September 2007, members of the Greater London Assembly produced a breakdown of London boroughs, the number of cameras in each, compared to the crime clear-up rates. When plotted on a graph, as you can see here, you'll see that the statistics show there is no correlation between the number of cameras and the crime clear-up rate. In fact, in four out of five of the boroughs with the most cameras, they had the record of solving crime that was below average. The Campbell Collaboration Report into CCTV 2008, part funded by the National Policing Improvement Agency. The evaluation of CCTV schemes in city and town centres and public housing did not have a significant effect on crime. The Oxford Policing Policy Forum report, Too Much Surveillance 2008, found Britain is in danger of becoming a society where everyone is effectively on parole. Home Office Study 292 2005 found it would be easy to conclude from the information presented in this report that CCTV is not effective. The majority of the schemes evaluated did not reduce crime. And even where there was a reduction, this was mostly not due to CCTV. Nor did CCTV schemes make people feel safer, much less change their behaviour. Clearly, this isn't the conclusion the Home Office wanted. So an extra line was added to these concluding remarks. That, however, would be too simplistic a conclusion. <laughs> what is the point of doing research if you are going to disregard its conclusions? But disregarding the research against CCTV is all too common. In June 2008, Prime Minister Gordon Brown gave a speech to the Institute of Public Policy Research about security and liberty. He said, in central Newcastle, after CCTV was installed, burglaries fell by 56%, criminal damage by 34% and theft by 11%. Gordon Brown took these figures from Home Office Study 252. If we look a bit closer at Home Office Study 252, we find that it says that CCTV had an undesirable effect in Newcastle. The reason why they say this is because crime did fall by 21.6% in the area with cameras, but it fell by 29.7% in the area without cameras. Not a single journalist reported this fact. But then disregarding inconvenient facts is not that uncommon either. In Oxford, the Oxford Mail reported on the 19th of April this year, two months after cameras were installed in East Oxford, uh, on a report called Cowley Road Crime Falls Under CCTV's Gaze, they said, figures obtained by the Oxford Mail under the Freedom of Information Act showed that there were 150 crimes on the Cowley Road in the first two months of operation. That was a drop from 166 over the same time last year. Well, we got hold of that Freedom of Information request and found that some crimes went up. Those included possession of firearms, racially aggravated criminal damage to a vehicle, theft from a vehicle, theft or unauthorised taking of a bicycle, shoplifting, a fray and administering a substance with intent. So what quote did the media choose to represent this? They spoke to Jan Bartlett, a local trader, who completely disregarding the crimes that went up said, the results are better than we could have imagined. Our area is now safer for my staff and all members of the public than to the tops using Mansell Gardens play area, where the fall in used needles and condoms, as well as the improved crime statistics, has improved the quality of life. So, the successes are massively overstated, the failures are disregarded, and where CCTV shouldn't even be part of a strategy, it has become the strategy. In 2007, the Home Office and the Association of Chief Police Officers published a national CCTV strategy that lays out an agenda for the future of CCTV. In that strategy, they stated, anecdotal evidence suggests that over 80% of the CCTV footage supplied to the police is far from ideal. So, did the strategy suggest rolling back this costly failed experiment? 
Far from it. Recommendation 44 states, promote CCTV and its expansion by forming evidence-based business cases. The strategy calls for more advanced CCTV, but every technological advance further erodes freedoms of the public. Increasingly, we see police criticising CCTV, but such criticism is being used to upgrade the surveillance cameras. The cycle goes something like this. Convince the public CCTV works. Install the systems. Admit it doesn't work. Upgrade the systems, promising it will work this time. Repeat ad infinitum. The National CCTV Strategy calls for registration of all cameras and proposing networking cameras to the police. That includes private cameras. Plans are laid out for a CCTV network in conjunction with other databases to allow for data matching, mining and profiling, such as town centre cameras connected to ANPR systems and transport cameras to travel cards. And ultimately, there is the search for the panacea. The search continues for the panacea of CCTV, systems capable of automatic picture analysis, person identification and behavioural analysis. Some of these schemes are already being developed. One project is the ADABTS project, Automatic Detection of Abnormal Behaviour and Threats in Crowded Spaces. It is seeking to develop models of suspicious behaviour so these can be automatically detected using CCTV and other surveillance methods. The Samurai Project, suspicious and abnormal behaviour monitoring using a network of cameras for situation awareness enhancement. This one seeks to develop abnormal behaviour detection systems based on a heterogeneous sensor network consisting of both fixed position CCTV cameras and mobile wearable cameras with audio and positioning sensors. But for a taste of where all CCTV is headed, we'd only look at the network of automatic number plate or ANPR cameras that is being constructed across the UK. In the past, repressive regimes such as the Soviet Union used roadside checkpoints to periodically check drivers' papers. Up until now, the absence of such checkpoints is what made the UK a free country that respected the rights of its citizens. Automatic number plate recognition cameras constitute an automated checkpoint system that, along with other surveillance cameras, undermines the status of the UK as a free country. ANPR cameras are linked to multiple databases, use automated data matching and allow tracking of individuals as they move around on the UK roads. These cameras were originally sold as helping to identify stolen or suspect vehicles. But the latest Association of Chief Police Officers ANPR strategy states that these cameras will be embedded into core police business by March 2010. How do we get from uninsured cars to a core policing tool? Where was the public debate and what sort of a society are we creating? Should a national database of facial scans be constructed of the UK population via the Identity Card Project or the biometric passports, then all indications are that CCTV could and would be linked to such databases in the future. Such a reliance on technology brings with it risks. But what is it that people say? Nothing to hide, nothing to fear? Kieran O'Hara puts it another way. If you keep within the law, and the government keeps within the law, and its employees keep within the law, and the computer holding the database doesn't screw up, and the system is carefully designed according to well-understood software engineering principles and maintained properly, and the government doesn't scrimp on outlay, and all the data are entered carefully, and the police are adequately trained to use the system, and the system isn't hacked into, and your identity isn't stolen, and the local hardware functions, well, you have nothing to fear. But there's nothing we can do about it, right? Wrong. We the people need to stop the surveillance state. Yeah. Yeah. Desmond Brown QC, chairman of the Bar Council, told a meeting earlier this month that in a country with a strong common law tradition, it is the common law principles which govern protection of our privacy that we should all be working to uphold. We must. 
We must not rely on politicians to bring in more legislation to fix it. Regulation is not the solution. We need to demand that politicians stop wasting our money on a technology that trades our liberty for security and loses both. So how do we fight it? Most of the decisions are made at a local level. You just need to know who to fight. Attend local council meetings, lobby councillors, ask them to prove the need for CCTV. Decisions are often made by crime and disorder reduction partnerships. These were set up under the Crime and Disorder Act 1998. They're given responsibilities to generate crime control strategies, given names like Safer Oxford, Safer Birmingham, Safer London. Like Pubwatch and other quangos, these are shadowy coalitions of bodies that allow policy laundering by police and local authorities. Join neighbourhood action groups, often linked to these crime and disorder groups. Use the Freedom of Information Act and local government acts to obtain information and find out what these people are up to. Believe it or not, licensing is another major area. Local license committees are now a front line in the fight, against civil, fight for civil liberties. The Licensing Act 2003 is being used as a way of removing freedoms for alcohol. Police will often contest a license or license variation unless certain criteria are met. Attend local licensing committees. Ask the committee to tell you why freedoms are being traded for booze. The local and national media. Write to the media. London pub landlord Nick Gibson went to the media when the police required CCTV as a licensing condition. As a result of media intention, the council backed down. But be careful with the media, because much of them love CCTV, as it's good copy and good images for them. Then there's the police. Ask for detailed crime data, down to the beat code level. The new crime maps are not good enough. Find out about other interventions they're doing, such as changing policing methods at the same time as putting cameras in. And look for trends in data. What if we do nothing? We shall find in 10 or 20 years' time that serious crime has risen yet further, terrorism will be more strongly embedded, and law enforcement agencies will still be fa failing in their intelligence and ability to prevent such activities. Yet we, as decent citizens, will have sacrificed completely our rights to privacy and anonymity. This is a very serious matter. Let me just leave you with one more quote from science fiction writer Philip K. Dick about government and trust, which I think relates not just to CCTV, but everything that we're speaking about here today. He said, any government which assumes that the population is going to do something evil has already lost its franchise to govern. The tacit contract between a government and the people is that the government will trust the people and the people will trust the government. But once the government begins to mistrust the people it is governing, it loses its mandate to rule because it is no longer acting as a spokesperson for the people but is acting as an agent of persecution. Thank you.